All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. So again, I appreciate your patience. We had an uh, issue uh, with Mac PC uh, incompatibility, but we have since resolved it. So we'll be able to have our visuals for everyone here. Um, so as you can see, uh, our presentation is about character design and implications for player experience. Uh, before I go into my presentation, which is going to take maybe about 10 minutes, and then we'll have another 10 minute presentation, and then we'll just sort of open it up for Q&A uh, from the audience. So that's basically the overall format uh, for the next hour. I thought we could also briefly run through introductions. Uh, so we'll just go down the row. Um, my name is Jess, uh, Jess Tompkins. I'm a PhD student at Indiana University. I study the social psychological effects of games on players, and one of my uh, sort of areas of interest is characters and how they affect the player uh, and the experience in the game world. So that's one thing I'm looking at right now with my research. I come at, and my perspective is very much um, social science, uh, but I also dabble a bit in uh, critical theory as well, and I do a bit of game design as a hobby. So, uh, hi, um, hey. I'm Kevin Chen, and uh, this is Yasmin. I'm Yasmin Omar Ada. And uh, we are from Nuclear Fission Software, which is a small indie studio in, uh, in Brooklyn, New York. And we are working on a, woo! <laughs> <laughs> We're Brooklyn then. Uh, so yeah, uh, and we are developing a game um, that's actually due really soon, in the next couple of months, called Four Horsemen, which is about the immigrant experience and touches upon a lot of this kind of stuff. Oh, uh, Kevin is writer, programmer, all that stuff, and I am the character designer and character artist. Hello. Uh, hi. Um, I am Elisa Melendez. Uh, I am the new media manager at Gearbox Software. It's a little, little indie thing. Um, and uh, I am also a PhD candidate in sociology studying gender and music games, namely Rock Band and Rock Smith. A lot of my research focuses on the translation of rock music, which has its own sort of gendered coded experience into a video game world and what kinds of gender scripts are replicated or what opportunities for subversion of those scripts there are when that translation is made into video game form. So a lot of my focus is on avatar generation and looking at um, the text that comes with the clothes that your character can wear. Um, and I'll get into some more of that stuff, but a, a lot of uh, my stuff tends to focus on representation and character representation in music games. So there you go. Uh, and like Eliza, I also do a bit of gender. Um, my minor is actually in sociology, so <laughs> we have some overlap there as well. I've taken a lot of um, gender, sociology of gender courses. So most of you as gamers are probably already well aware of this, but just to give you a brief recap about like, the types of representations <coughs> of games, they, characters tend to be very gender stereotyped. We are seeing this change, we are seeing more diversity, but historically we see uh, princess archetypes for female characters, um, damsels in distress, or conversely, we tend to see the exact opposite, sort of these sexualized femme fatales um, predominating uh, the leading roles for uh, playable female characters in games. Uh, of course, Lara, Lara Croft has, of course, evolved since her um, previous iterations in like the mid-90s, you know, mid early 2000s. We have um, a much different Lara today, obviously, but historically speaking, I think this is uh, a very prominent archetype for women in games. Um, and then for men, they have their own problematic representations as well. Uh, we tend to see these very dominating, very hyper-masculine portrayals, uh, particularly in fighting games, uh, but also for leading protagonists more generally. <coughs> But why, you know, why does this matter? Um, I think at audiences, audiences are very diverse at, for games. We have a lot of diversity in terms of who's playing them. And people want, to, just like in films, people want to see characters that look like them or characters that they can relate to. Uh, 
a, a study, actually my advisor at Indiana University, she and a group of researchers um, did an analysis of character body types in games, and they did this for um, female characters and male characters, play, um, playable and non-playable. And what they found in their study is that the, the body types for male characters, on average, line up with the average body type of, the male, uh, of males in the United States. But for female characters, they were a lot thinner than the average um, body type of the, of the average North American woman. So it, wasn't, it was representative, uh, male character body types were more representative of real men, but this was not the case for female character body types. They were not representative um, for game characters. Also, I think this image here sort of summarizes uh, some of the issues with uh, leading protagonists in games. Generally, I mean, just looking the same. The, the male brunettes with some kind of stubble, uh, mid-20s to early 30s, that, uh, that's just a very prominent archetype that we see. If you've, if having many of you, of course, play games, so you already know this. Yeah, we don't see enough um, minority representation. And one of the arguments for why this is important is if, if that minorities are, and diverse people aren't attracted to games, if, they're not, if games aren't appealing to them or resonating with them, then if they're not gonna play them, then why would they have an interest in making them and also producing more uh, diverse and interesting content? So it's kind of like a uh, self-perpetuation perpetuating cycle, right? If people aren't playing them, if diverse people aren't playing them, then they're not gonna, they're probably not gonna make them either and contribute to change, um, contribute to diversity. So that, that is, I think, why centrally this is important, why representation matters. Um, and then uh, in my, my discipline, which is the social science, applying social scientific studies to media and data <coughs> research, uh, scholars have found that affects, real effects so social comparison theory is this idea that as humans, we naturally want to compare ourselves to others. Now people do do that, you know, this is sort of a subjective thing. You may compare, your, may compare yourself with others or people in media to a lesser extent than other people do. So this does vary on an individual basis. But this is something that humans in general tend to do is that we compare ourselves to others. Um, this is especially uh, perhaps in, in terms of the research, it has focused on women and how women compare themselves to others. Um, but in a, in a game where women did play a beach volleyball game, they reported lower body esteem after play, play, playing the game, so they didn't feel as good about themselves afterwards. Uh, There's another study that looked at um, playing as ideal and high <coughs> characters. So they, they used, um, funnily enough, they did use two characters named Jade. So Jade from Beyond um, Good and Evil and then Jade from Mortal Kombat. Jade was like a, an ideal character. So she's thin, but she's not exaggerated. Whereas Jade in Mortal Kombat is very hypersexualized hyper and her body proportions are very exaggerated. So this was a hyper ideal condition in which they, you know, they played these games. So, but interestingly, this is what I find very interesting about that particular study, is that women who played as a hyper-ideal character, so Jade from Mortal Kombat, they actually felt marginally better about their weight and marginally more sexually attractive than women in the, in the ideal condition, so playing as Jade from Beyond um, Good and Evil. So there's something really interesting going on there where maybe if the character is so exaggerated, maybe we can actually feel better about ourselves because we see ourselves as more realistically proportioned and healthier. I don't know. It's, it's, we're still tr trying to explain that. Another thing I think that plays a role in how characters affect us is also the gameplay. Mortal Kombat is a fighting game. It's very empowering if you are able to kick ass, maybe as this very sex sexy and beautiful woman, and you're, you're a female, you could very well take pleasure in that and take enjoyment out of that experience if you are not only physically attractive, but also completely <coughs> as dominate every male character in that game. Um, Whereas Beyond Good and Evil is a different type of play. There isn't, perhaps, arguably not as empowering or as wish for fantasy involvement in that. So I think it's more than just what characters look like, it's also about the gameplay as well and how that can affect us as players. Um, and then for men, yeah, there's, there's a, there was a, a follow-up study where we had uh, hyper-ideal, so we had Alan Wake as like an ideal guy. He's, Kind of like the archetypical male protagonist, he's brunette, he's, he's pretty slim, 
uh, pretty average looking, but then the hyper ideal was Ken from Street Fighter, very um, exaggerated, very muscular. And for men, the, uh, effects were found where exposure and, and gameplay with Ken uh, caused men low, uh, with low trait social comparison. So these are people who, um, being low on trait social comparison means that you don't, you are less likely to compare yourself to others. So these were people who were not frequently comparing themselves to others. But when they played this game, they reported more negative body attitudes and um, more body image disturbance afterwards. So potentially these hyper-masculine characters in games could actually be more harmful to men than we might acknowledge. So usually when we talk about games and popular culture, we're often concerned about the way women look, but we also need to consider how these hyper-masculine representations might potentially be affecting men as well. Um, social cognitive theory is the, uh, basically, <coughs> social cognitive theory is how, well, I'm sorry, I'm really blanking on social cognitive theory. Can anyone help me out on that one? Socio sociologist. Ugh. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I'm sorry, I'm like really blanking on I social cognitive theory. I haven't had coffee. Um, social cognitive theory is kind of like how, okay, in a general sense, how we process things through the social, our social environment. Uh, this was another gameplay study where women played as either sexualized, sexualized Laura, Laura being this in her evening gown, I suppose, and then the non-sexualized was her winter attire in, I can't remember which Tomb Raider, but some of you probably recognize the outfits. But this was another study, this is a psychological study where women who played as a sexualized Laura Croft reported lower self-esteem, um, and then men and, men and women reported less favorable, favorable attitudes at, uh, about women's cognitive abilities and physical capabilities. So uh, again, just overall, um, unfortunately, the more negative side effects. Interestingly, the, interestingly however, there no, were no differences for self-esteem, uh, rather these sort of um, perceptions of women in general, not necessarily about uh, the self, but about women in general. Uh, identification, so we know that these effects are happening. I think some of these studies haven't necessarily explored the role of identification. That's something that I want to explore in my research. Um, I'm currently doing an experiment in, uh, at IU that involves how we identify with game characters and how, that and how gameplay and narrative sort of influence self-perception afterwards. And so, it basically, in video game scholarship, the idea of identification proposes that players may experience empowerment, which is a reduction of self-discrepancy. <coughs> so feeling um, self-discrepant is if you feel like you don't live up to your own expectations. Uh, so th this has been theorized that if you can feel empowerment, you may experience reduced self-discrepancy during the identification process with a game character. Because many games are very empowering, right? They, that's often the central role um, that you have in the game. And so people have hypothesized that this identification can occur in a variety of ways, including wishful identification, so wanting to be like the character, or similarity, which is, I think, particularly true in role-playing games where if you, you know, not everyone creates a character that looks like them, but some people do. And so if you do relate to your character in some way, whether it's physically or even personality-wise, you may identify with that character. As well as empathy, if we empathize with a character in a given narrative or um, conflict, that could also uh, create some kind of identification experience. So this kind of uh, wraps up my my presentation, we're gonna move on and hear the pr perspectives of actual game designers, which I'm also very excited to hear about. But hopefully, after we wrap up and we have the Q&A, here's some questions I'd like to maybe propose to all of you who are here. If you don't, you might have other questions and that's perfectly fine, but um, something <coughs> you can certainly talk about is like how, how important is diversity, um, how important is character similarity and or empathy? And do we prefer the power fantasies or do we wanna see um, do we also enjoy other takes on characters? And, do we o and if we don't always identify with playable protagonists, because I don't think we always do, right? Um, how does that change the gameplay experience? So I'm gonna hand it over to, to Ken and pull up his PowerPoint. Kevin, sorry, we just met today for the first time.
from some country other than the one that you're from. It's going to have a lot less power than one that's about where you're from. So we went the sort of impossible route, and our game features 14 different selectable like countries for your protagonist to be from. And the characters are the same, but where they're from changes. And that's one of our central gimmicks. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we do that. And um, so a lot, of, a lot of diversity talks. Um, I mean, every single con you go to is going to have one, um, and, and there's tons of like personal essays. Like if you have, if you're familiar with it, like I recommend uh, some of the things that Sean Alexander Allen has written. Uh, some of the things, yeah, or like um, Austin Walker has written some beautiful things about Mafia Three and uh, and Watch Dogs Two. Uh, and there's a lot of literature out there about why representation is important and why it affects people so emotionally and uh, mean meaningfully that they have characters who look like themselves. So we're not going to talk about that at all. <laughs> um, instead, we're going to talk about like what's the sort of next step forward from there. As a game company, how can we sort of deliver that to players in a way that other companies might maybe not have sort of the time or the flexibility or the appetite for risk to deal with. So to do that, we're going to talk about why this is hard. Because a lot of the way that people talk about like this kind of thing is like, oh, why don't you just throw in some uh, some shaders? And it's like, great, now your protagonist is black. Now your protagonist is Indian. It's like, problem solved. Um, and no, not really. Uh, we're going to talk about a while why that isn't convincing to a lot of players, both anecdotally and just in our own experiences. So the first reason, um, any successful video game, and by successful I mean one that sort of sells well enough to attract a broad audience, um, is going to attract a player base uh, bigger than its development team. So you think about how many races are, like, say, in Pokemon Sun and Moon. I mean, the NPCs are all sort of like Alter Universe Hawaiian. You can play as all these like different sort of skin colors, and they're never like named as in like, oh, this is the European guy, this is like the the Arab guy. But there's enough of sort of a mix that you can kind of identify. Uh, but this is made by a Japanese company, and if you think about how relatively culturally homogenous Japan is. Like, there's no way that they, they could get in a developer like on their team for every single sort of identity they want to target. So for developers, this is really difficult because they're acting from a place of ignorance. And sure, we can offset this a little bit by more diversity in the industry. But let's face it, you know, when you sell a big AAA game internationally, or even in, an indie game with a wide release, um, it takes a lot of research, a lot of hard work. I can understand why a lot of companies don't want to put in that time, effort, and money. Um, and the other big reason is that video, one of the reasons why video games move us so deeply is because they're about personal expression. But what a lot of people, developers and designers even don't seem to understand sometimes is that it's not about their own expression. It's about the player's expression. It's about you being in there and being the characters and making choices and fantasizing about being them. And so the uh, effective designer, if they want to emotionally create emotionally resonant characters, they have to get in the player's head. And this is where that old word that nobody likes anymore comes in, the word privilege. Where it's like, there's a sort of like callousness to me, like, well, how am I, as a, like an Asian American designer, really going to understand what it's like to be, say, like a, a Taino Native American? And, you know, who am I to say what their experiences will be and how they'll be resonant? So I end up having to guess a little bit, and that is fraught with lots and lots of dangers if I don't research correctly. So this is like really difficult territory. Um, so one of the very common ways that people will sort of deal with this is like, okay, you know, let's not worry about race at all. Let's do color. It's like, okay, there's only so many shades of skin tones like in around the world, everywhere. So you know, you've got like a brown person, you've got like a black person, you've got a white person, and you have someone with like it's kind of like 
sallow, yellowish tone, and that is the sort of Asian, even though Asians don't really look like that. Um, and then they're like, okay, we're good. And that's an easy answer and a very attractive one because it's so easy to implement, no matter whether you're doing a 2D game or a 3D game. But the problem with this is that race doesn't really work this way. Like this, this photo uh, I took at my uh, college reunion a couple years ago. Here we have three different um, programmers. Um, there's me and two of my friends. And you can tell instantly just look, by looking at this photo that the three of us are different races. And if, in fact, if you are uh, Russian American or you are um, Asian American or you're just like straight up, you know, 13th generation descended from the Mayflower, you might even see like your own race represented here. But if you went to Photoshop and used the color picker and ran this over our skin, they're actually really, really similar. So obviously there's more at play there than just skin color. Uh, the other problem is, I mean, like we have two, we have two psychologists on this panel who understand this way better than I do. But uh, there's a psychological bias at play too, because um, we humans are tribal creatures. Like the same forces that allow things like this whole subculture that allows like Macbeth to happen are uh, it's it also lets us sort of identify like members of our own tribe of our own race. So. Um, there is a really interesting study about uh, this thing that they call the cross-race effect. Um, I, I have one site study cited here, but there's been dozens with similar results, where they get a whole bunch of people in a room, like some some like white folks and some black folks, to go look at a photo of like you know some like white and black and brown people and identify the uh, the races of each of the people in the photo. And it's been found consistently that white people are able to tell which people in the photo are white more often than people in the black. Uh, that of black people are, and vice versa. Like people are better at recognizing members of their own race, their own tribe, than they are mem recognizing members of other tribes. And they've done this study over and over again with different races, with you know Japanese people and Hispanic people, and you know every single like combination you think of, even like Japanese and Koreans. Um, you think about the whole stereotype. It's like oh, all Asians look alike. Um, that's a very Western sort of thing. In Asia, like well, when I go back and visit my parents, people be like oh you must have so much trouble like uh, living in America. All these white people look the same. So here we have the problem where it's like, if I am making a game where you have like say um, two different groups of like Af uh, Africans who are very very distinct in uh, in the eyes of players who might identify with either of these groups, then uh, like they might look different to they might look the same to me, but they're going to look different. To, uh, and like, that's why uh, so many times uh, people try to do minority representation falls short. People are like, oh, this doesn't look like a real black person. This doesn't look like a real Asian. Um, and there's nature is against us. So uh, one way that people get around this is create a character. And uh, one of the problems with this is like, it, I mean, in, the, in theory this works because they're like, okay, well, maybe I don't understand what your race looks like, but you do, because you know, cross-race effect, right? You know what a member of your own race looks like. So you do it. And this is sort of a cop-out, uh, because this is sort of like, players kind of expect us, developers, to be like, you know, oh, tell us a story, you know, make some like cool characters that we can look up to and, and believe in. And then this is like us saying to you, it's like, no, you tell me a story, you make these characters. And it's like, it's also kind of a, a lie, because like a good example for this, uh, for me, I recently played uh, Saints Row 4 and I enjoyed it a lot. Um, but the protagonist of Saints Row 4 is a very, very distinct sort of character, a very like brash, kind of like aggressive, um, kind of like funnily sociopathic kind of person. And I originally designed this character, not knowing anything about the game because I just started it, uh, as a sort of like shy hipster girl. And it was like really, really dissonant to sort of see her like punching people in the face like for comedic effect and all that stuff. So it's like when you write a character and then you have the player kind of just draw a shade over them. Like this is sort of like misleading and doesn't really solve the problem. Um, there's also the issue that uh, there's an assumption among a lot of developers that players want a kind of reverse cosplay where they want to literally play as themselves. And if this were true, all the characters we'd see in like Terra and all the like big MMOs like you would see a lot more, uh, like I guess, like big pasty dudes. <laughs> um, no, there is a definitely, like Jess mentioned in her talk, uh, an, an element of wish fulfillment. Like people don't want to play as themselves; they want to play as someone who exemplifies the best of who they could be, someone they can aspire to. And that's something as developers we have to deliver to the players. It's not something we can just ask you guys to do yourselves. 
So with that in mind, um, here's how we deal with that and how we kind of like not taking any of those tropes that uh, AAA does. Like this, this is what we did in our upcoming coming game for Horseman. This is coming out really soon. Um, so our, one of our primary strategies is we're going to focus on race and not phenotype. Uh, because phenotype is like visual indicators of like what makes people genetically different. Like uh, Asians, for example, have epithelial folds. We have these little folds over our eyes, which like white people don't. And that's one of the ways that Americans tell Asians apart from white people. Um, but these are very regionally spe specific. Like different cultures around the world have different ways of reading people's faces and, and you know skin color and all that stuff. So we kind of like look at some other things instead that will make players like immediately think like, oh yeah, you know that's you know this person or this role in society or whatever. Um, Yasmin can actually uh, tell us a little more about how their illustrations. Whoa. <laughs> Kind of like the cheese. Hi, everybody. I have a laptop right now. So, hi. Um, as character designer, we kind of run into, like Kevin said, this is very dangerous territory, <coughs> but it is really important. So, we have a lot of design challenges that we had to work through very early on in the process. And one of them is when you have character creators, as we talked about, they tend to kind of just put one shade and be like, okay, this is going to represent you. So, you get like one shade of like vaguely tan or brown and that's supposed to represent you and everyone in like your region. Sometimes even worse, they'll represent, you know, multiple peoples and expect that's gonna be good enough. For our game, we didn't do that. What we're doing is we have characters with uh, multiple shades in their country. So different characters from the same race are going to have different shades of skin and hair. For example, I'm Palestinian and not every Palestinian is gonna have the same hex value as my skin. So even though it is impossible to stay 100% true to life, we are doing our best. So, as you can see here, here's one character across uh, multiple cultures and he has his palettes based on where he's at. And we worked really hard on making sure that these palettes represent the best that we can. So, what we also have the advantage of, as you saw earlier, we have two examples. We have Pitfall and we have Fallout. Now, I am a comics artist and an illustrator, so that is my background, and we kind of have the advantage of working in a style that is between those two extremes. We have illustrative faces that help you suture into the narrative and help you recognize yourself in them because they are slightly dissociated from reality. Um, based on that, uh, all of the cultures that swap, their uh, clothes and their indicators and their uh, designs like tattoos, freckles, uh, body types, etc., hair uh, styles, they will all vary throughout uh, the cultures and they'll be, maybe in one culture you'll play through one playthrough and it will be considered attractive or acceptable in another culture, uh, it's not going to be the same way. So all these choices are very deliberate and they're designed to open up a conversation with the player internally uh, as opposed to just being like visual indicators. There we go. Okay, so another way we do this is through uh, language, and this can be done very poorly as anyone who recognizes this guy who we're kind of familiar with. I have a whole spiel on Barrett, which I'm not gonna give on now <laughs> because we don't have time. He's a very, very fascinating character. There's a lot actually that's uh, Square, um, well, formerly Square, now Square Enix did right with him. Uh, which kind of disappeared in a huge wall of overused dialect. But um, Square did have a sort of like, they were going on something good here, where uh, when you have characters not all talk in this sort of like very standard mid-Atlantic English, which a lot of people tend to do in games, out of fear of like, oh my god, I'm gonna be racist. Um, when you do apply dialect right, it does make characters feel more familiar and more casual and uh, it, it is one of the ways that people identify members of their own race. And this effect can be so powerful, even though a character doesn't actually look like you. It can be like, yeah, yeah, that's somebody like, you know, from my neighborhood, that's someone, someone from my country. So we want to play up on this a lot. And this is really easy to do in, uh, in a video game because a lot of like text substitution stuff already happens for purposes of localization. So we just expand that system and it just sort of like, um, it's, it's really easy to just change the way a talk, uh, character talks like their mannerisms and stuff. 
Um, a lot of things that like both localizers and writers tend to ignore in video games, though, is that this is very culturally powerful. You can tell a lot about a character's cultural values, about their religion, um, about their concept of who they are as a person, as informed by their race and their their history and their and how the, all of that ties into the game. You can get all of this without saying a word about it in the game's like backstory. You don't need any exposition or anything like that. Um, so instead of just like throwing in lots of colloquialisms like you know y'all or you know, what's up or uh, we take a very different tack in the course. We do this through swearing. Um, we have yeah. Uh, okay, <laughs> I'm not even gonna tell you guys like what countries these stand for, in, like which real countries they stand for. I'm just gonna show you these two slides. Uh, so this is for the Principality of Baikoku. That's one of the selectable countries. And this, the next one is from the uh, Federation of, of the Levant. Now note how these are both kind of English-ish. Like I didn't go and I can like switch between these two again. Yay! <laughs> Uh, so, like, I translate very little between these two, but just their choice of words, their choice of diction, uh, the sort of like religious epithets, and like it says so much about who these characters are, what they value, and what's fascinating is like these two characters are the like the, between these two countries are the same character, but their own worldviews and their own beliefs are affected by the culture that they grow up in, and they reference this in their speech. So you have the same sort of idea, like, communicated twice uh, in a different sort of cultural context. If I can just chime in for a second. Um, we had the slide that had the Arabic cursing, and just working on this game as a Middle Eastern person who speaks Arabic, uh, I laughed myself every single time. You show me one of those in game, not only because it's funny for me, but also because it's actually a delight to see yourself in your language actually represented in a game, especially when you're as underrepresented as Middle Eastern people and Arabic speakers. Oh yeah, that was very deliberate because um, the history of the Levant is that it's constantly being colonized and there's like all of these different countries coming and leaving their imprint. So we wanted to create a sense of a country with a history of chaos and how this comes across in their cultural values. And actually for me, I'm Taiwanese, uh, one of the, one of the uh, countries in here is the Green Isles. And just having people swear at each other in Taiwanese, because these are like, um, our characters are teenagers, and they're not video game teenagers. They're like, you know, bright eyed and innocent and Final Fantasy S. Like, no, these are real teenagers. They're like <laughs> pissy and annoyed and trying to figure out who they are. Um, so, just having them swear in Taiwanese and code switch between English and Taiwanese was really special to me. I don't think I'll probably ever see this in any game other than what I make. So, that's, if that's special to me, I hope the, the other races in the game, what they do, it's going to be special to you as well. It's this feeling of like, hey, Finally, someone who speaks my language. Um, so another th really big thing that a lot of games miss is that race is defined almost, well not solely, but largely in relation to other races. Like, you know, what's black in the United States might not be black in, uh, in like Uganda. What's white over here might not be, what, might not pass for white even in like London. Uh, every country has a very different idea of what diversity looks like and has a very different way of categorizing different races. So what really makes somebody, like one race and its power dynamics with another race like potent is them in context with each other. Like context really defines race even more than skin color, even more than culture. So think about how this scene right now, uh, one of the country configurations reads from a, as a Western audience with an understanding of um, you know, Western race relations and the, the legacy, the horrible legacy of, of slavery and this whole war and so on. Now look at this other, the same scene from another country. Um, this isn't even something as simple as like, oh, I switched black and white. It's really not that simple. Um, think about how uh, our character War on the left reads with that sort of like white tone as, um, as compared to the tone of the teacher on the uh, previous slide. And this brings in so much subtext. Because in this slide, you have this sort of like, even before we've said a word, like there's not a word of in-game dialogue in this slide. Um, you get this sort of expectation of like, oh, here's like a black teenage girl and her white teacher, and, and the kind of power dynamic you expect from that. And here, it's more like, here's this like white girl kind of having to explain something 
to her brown teacher, like maybe she has something to apologize for. The dialogue does not change, but how you come into it as a player does. Because even if we create, no matter what kind of fantasy world we create, like players live in the real world and they're gonna bring this political subtext anyway. So we embrace that subtext instead of going against it. So that is basically our whole talk. Um, if you're interested in our game, we have a whole bunch of cards over there, which you are free to take uh, with the URL of our, our game on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't have to see that. I mean, yeah, you can also pick one up after the talk or whatever. But the uh, game's coming out really soon. I'm really excited about it. I'm really excited to bring it to you guys. Uh, it is going to be on um, on Mac, on Windows, and possibly on iOS. We're still working on that. And uh, that's our talk. Awesome. That that was great. <laughs> that was awesome. And I'm not I'm not gonna take up too much time because I do kind of want you to talk to us um, at some point. But just to sort of kind of echo a lot of the sentiments that are being shared here, um, the the addition of language I think is so huge because. As a Puerto Rican woman, I can, and then, and then, and then first off, showing that you know ethnicity is not a monolith, I'm, I'm sure as, as soon as I said Puerto Rican woman, there were some people that went, oh, that's what she is. <laughs> okay. Um, it, would, it would mean the world to me to have more than one Spanish accent <laughs> in anything, um, but, but even more than, then, you know, I, I have an interesting time as, as sometimes one of the only Spanish speakers in my universe when someone gives me something to translate and then I go, is this Latin American Spanish or is this like Spanish from Spain? And they're like, what? And I'm like, honey, <laughs> honey bunny, it's different. And then even like, like country by country, like there are, there are words that stand for like dick in Puerto Rico and it's like the name of a bug in another country and like you gotta be careful, man. Um, but you know, even, even just being able to like hear like an ay bendito, you know, which is like an instant marker of Puerto Ricanness that as soon as I hear it, I'm like, my people. Um, like, like I, I, I love that you're playing with that and, that, and and that makes me happy. That makes my, my brown little heart warm. Um, <laughs> um, you know, um, even even things, you know, like, like, like playing Assassin's Creed Black Flag, I think I identified with it so closely. Uh, yeah, I was a dude. Um, but running around and then kind of seeing, like, at one point I stumbled onto an island and there was a woman and she was brown and she was Taina. And that's like my Native American peoples were the Taino Indians. And I went, <gasps> someone took the care to actually stick one of them in here. That's awesome. Um, and, and just sort of like seeing, seeing little glimpses of yourself in, in, in those different ways is, is huge. From a, from a historical perspective, whether that's you, uh, I'm the kind of person that likes to make myself because I don't see myself. So whenever I can, you know, because somewhere, you know, I'm sure in some data bank somewhere, someone is registering, hey, this person made a brown person with red hair <laughs> and uh, kind of a wide nose, and that's cool. And I was like, I want to freaking be that data point. I want to contribute to that data because people, people look at that kind of stuff and like, hey, wow, if, if this is something people want, this is something that maybe we should continue to include. Um, in, in a sort of general sense, also kind of piggybacking on Jess's research, a lot of the stuff that I've kind of read in terms of, of avatars and the way that we kind of identify with them, it extends not only to the games, but also looking at the ways in which they are marketed as well. Um, because even before you even play the game, if you look at a cover or an advertisement and you don't necessarily see that you even might be included in the first place. You might not want to pick it up. Um, so things like looking at, uh, there is an, there's an article, I believe it is by Burgess and Sturmer, I'm practice, practicing for my dissertation here, that looks at video game covers mm -hmm. in, a, in a world like where, you know, like, like, like yeah, like, 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 like before, before, you know, things like reading online reviews, sometimes that might be the only thing that you see. And not only is it 
how many women there are, um, but it's also what they're doing. Um, and I think what they're doing uh, matters. Um, a lot of times, if you see a lady somewhere, um, at least in this particular study, you saw that they were not in positions of agency um, or, or did not have the ability to cause violence. They were not holding a weapon. They were not in the process of throwing a punch. Um, and someone was like, sweet, violence is bad. That's like good, right? Um, no, because, and this is like another panel entirely, in a world where violence is often the only time to get shit done, if your character is not doing violence, then they do not have the capacity to change their world. So, yeah, um, is, is a summary to that sort of feeling. Um, when, when it comes to representation, you know, another kind of pitfall, you know, is, is kind of thinking like, I'm just going to stick a lady in there. Um, and for me, there was a time period where I was like, shit, there's a lady in here. Yeah! And, and, and that would be what I would, what I would hang on to and latch on to and love forever and ever. The problem is when you stick in the one lady, uh, then she has to be every woman. Uh, she has to be sexy. She has to be not too sexy. She has to be smart, but not too smart. She has to be violent, but not like freaking like Xenia on a top. Like, GoldenEye style, like, killing people with her thighs and stuff. And that's cool, but that's also not cool when she's the only one who's, like, literally supposed to hang the entire weight of womanhood on her shoulders. And then not to even mention, you know, which is another panel entirely, the idea that even, and there thankfully are some uh, character creators that are kind of subverting this, uh, but, but the idea that you have to choose between two. We don't have two genders, y'all. Um, like, we don't have two sexes, y'all. So, you know, thankfully, there are some character creators that are kind of adding additional options where it's like, you are making a person. And this person can have makeup, and this person can have a certain body type, and this person can have an Adam's apple or not have an Adam's apple. I think it was like, um, I wanna say it was like. Wasn't the recent Sims pretty flexible about yes. that? Yes. Yeah, and, and even things like gender presentation as well in terms of like the kinds of walks and, and the kinds of the, the pitch of speech even things like that are, are important to think about, um, which, which makes me super happy, but you know, yeah, we have, we have a long, long way to go. Um, but even just sort of like making that leap from saying, you are making a man, you are making a woman, to you're making a character, and what is your character gonna look like? And just mush all of those options together to make a person uh, so that, you know, so, so that people can have the, the ability to sort of make themselves. Um, in terms of my own research, it's, it's interesting to consider the stuff that that kind of rock band does um, because they're playing with a particular medium, which when you think of rock music, I mean, think of the people that we lost last year that played with gender and notions of masculinity, notions of femininity, and the idea that once you sort of translate that universe into a video game, do you take some of that with you or do you take some of the, you know, balls to the wall, like rock and roll, guitar as phallic symbol. Yes, some of that is in there. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm finding that basically, like, like summary of my dissertation, um, when translated into video game form, a lot of video games in an effort to reproduce quote unquote real world uh, things in order to make them more relatable, they often translate a lot of the shitty <laughs> stuff. That's in there too. Um, you know, the idea that you can have a loading screen text that says, one in doubt, blame the singer's girlfriend. And that loading screen text immediately tells you something about the world that you're trying to inhabit, what the definition of rock music is. It is a Yoko Ono reference. It is a girlfriend breaking up the band reference. It is, once you put those packages together, it is also a heterosexual relationship reference. Um, predominantly. So like all those little packages, it was one little bit of loading screen text. Um, so I'm looking at even things that aren't necessarily the visual representation, but also things that kind of paint 
the entire world that you're supposed to embody and inhabit. Um, I find that, you know, while male and female avatars in rock band, for example, um, you know, I don't think men can wear skirts um, for the most part, uh, which is like, why? Um, or maybe they have kilts, <laughs> which is like, oh. um, but a lot of times they do have the same clothing options, um, male and female avatars do, and sometimes, and I think, I haven't finished coding this part yet, but for the most part, a lot of them have the same text for lady shirt, guy shirt, and that was like, awesome. But then there's some times where you have the same pair of corduroy pants, they'll have different text, um, and one set of text will be, well, you only need to learn three chords when you're wearing these pants. And then the other one is like, you know all of the chords in the world, and this is why you wear these chords. And it's like, well, you only need three, and you're a virtuoso. It's the same pair of fucking pants, but between men and women, there's a different message there uh, about virtuosity and about, yeah, you're pretty good for a girl, I guess. Um, so even, even in those little pieces, uh, it matters, and it's hard. <laughs> It's hard and it's difficult, um, and, and I applaud anybody that, that kind of like fights the good fight to sort of make it better. Um, for me, it's like, you know, I, I used to play paintball, and, and one of the things was like accuracy by volume, and that's kind of how I, <laughs> that's kind of how I play paintball, it's kind of how I shoot SMGs in games. It's like, it's like we're, we're gonna get there, we just gotta do it, uh, and, and, and we can't be afraid. Um, we also have to do the research, like, Literally brown people exist and literally the internet exists and like find a brown person To ask about stuff like if you want to write this particular person ask someone hire them pay them for their work <laughs> um, To to sort of educate you on stuff because because y'all it is the 21st century y'all have no excuse I was gonna say at this point. There's basically no excuse. There's no excuse. There's no excuse um, so I, that, that was a hodgepodge of crap, and we only have eight minutes left. So I, I'm gonna have some business cards um, up here. If you're a Gearbox fan, um, I also have some swag that I don't wanna take home with me. <laughs> so, 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 so please grab some. Um, and, and, and yeah, I'm definitely willing to, to sort of hear from you and, and, and talk to you about how you experience a lot of this stuff. Um, if you guys are all available, though, we can go on for another 15 minutes. Oh yeah, yeah. hell yeah. Awesome. Baller. Um, but I do want to say one thing, going from the Brown example, as well as what you said also about how privilege is a naughty word, or a very loaded mm -hmm. word nowadays. I think it's necessary, kind of, as an act of contrition for the sins of the past, like when Jews were not considered white, or Italians were not considered white, and other incredibly arbitrary things. That's kind of historical perspective. But even though we are the way we are in academia, and academia, you know, we're stuffy by design. There are times occasionally when we can have a little fun with it. And I always enjoy the quote when Italy ended up getting its ass kicked by Ethiopia, and despite the conventional wisdom saying that couldn't happen, this was like the end, you know, around the scramble rack, I don't know what everyone was trying to say, but that would be the whole history lesson. I love the way that one of the academics put it. The West explained Ethiopia's victories to sophistry. Since racism did not permit Westerners to acknowledge the black men of the was whites, Europeans suddenly discovered that Ethiopians were Caucasian darkened by his culture to the sun. <laughs> <laughs> <That's hot. laughs> and they say you can't have one. Wow. <laughs> I really enjoy writing that. Wow. It's like cheese whiz, it couldn't be possibly anything else. That's so long, stuck. You know? That, that's so good. They probably, their minds were probably like, what the heck? Um, I don't watch a lot of Bollywood, but I understand um, I think it's the main star, Jonah Akbar, um, one of the more prominent movies about the Mongol dynasty. He has he's talked to like NPR about the most obvious dichotomy about how we're in Western culture, perhaps not exclusively, we're big on tan. They like to bleach their skin, from what I understand. And that's certainly not exclusive, but it's certainly fascinating just the mere prospect of it when it comes to social context. Uh, social Uh, I'm going to use this excuse to talk about Barrett for just a minute. Do it! <laughs> You're up. Okay. 
I'm going to do this really quick. So Barrett is a fascinating character to me because if you take away what people remember about him, which is a Mr. T accent and the weird bloated, like, uh, he's a tiny little waist and he's got huge guns to the point where one of them is literally a gun. <laughs> uh, and he's big muscular legs. Like, he reads very much like a stereotypical African-American black man. And a lot of people have read this and are like, wow, that's really racist. And they're kind of right. Um, but you have to understand what Barrett is supposed to be to Japanese audiences when they designed this game. And this is very clear in the Japanese version of the game. He's a Bancho stock character. And the Bancho in Japan is like a youth gang leader who is like really like willful and confident and not that bright, but he's really endearing and Japanese people love him because he's so silly. And the whole point of Barrett is that Japanese audiences will see this and it's like, oh, here's this big like American, African American black guy and he's a Bancho. He talks like a Bancho. It's like, oh, I get it. I understand Africans Americans now. And like, no, you don't. Um, <laughs> so this was a mistake that the Japanese developers made in earnest, you know, with a very sort of positive motivation. They're like, okay, you know, hey, some people are kind of the same all over the world in some ways. And that there's something unrespectful about that. And you look at Barrett's actual backstory, which everyone forgets. You know, how he's like, you know, an eco-terrorist and he's doing this, you know, for his daughter. And he has these like really, this really conflict, uh, complex moral motivation that changes through the game and he grows a lot. And it's all buried under the action, but it's all there. You think about the narrative of like, even in the world where there's no Africa and there's no America and there's no like slavery or whatever, just what players see when they see this, like what like a Latin American player is going to see when they see like a brown guy, you know, fighting to save like the jungle or the rainforest from these this like universally like same colored like Shinra corporate empire and this like liberation struggle and how his his blackness like makes him more accessible that way, where you look at it, it's like, oh, I get it. You know, whereas if he was Japanese, that wouldn't come across at all. And I think that's really, really powerful and really, really underlooked in games. That this feeling that like, you take what players already know about history and understand they're gonna project it in the game and do more with it. And I really want to see a lot more of that in games in general. And from an electric power company that's gone up and has run them up more or less, sometimes, you know, shouldn't really actual titles and things like, oh, like minor detail, but it's still interesting. But um, visually speaking, I think the moment when he sees Corel burning, that's one of those great visual stimuli or things that video games, I think, convey arguably and superiorly and superior to the class. I think a better way of looking at his hand. I mean, just kind of like his hand like this, you know, with like inner arms and stuff like that. It's a great moment in the game, like the day, and the motion, even if it's actually. All right, did we want to open it up for Q&A for maybe 10, 15 minutes? And this goes for anyone sitting at the table. 